Well, welcome to the session. I just uh, wanted to start out by saying anyone that was late for the, uh, the keynote uh, presentations this morning, they will be put on the HQO website. I understand there were some uh, traffic challenges for some of you. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Susan Fitzpatrick, and I'm pleased to say I'm the CEO of the Toronto Central Lynn after 33 years with the Ontario Public Service. I've been at the Lynn for a month, and I'm having a wonderful time there. I'll be moderate, moderating this session. So the overview of the session is uh, uh, about Ontario's health system, as we heard in the keynote, typically delivers high quality episodes of care. However, international comparisons often highlight the need for Ontario to improve the delivery of integrated care and focus on key patient transitions. In order to address these concerns, several major initiatives are now underway to improve the delivery of integrated care in our system. This session will discuss the current approach to improving the delivery of integrated care in Ontario. It will highlight the transformations being implemented through health link, home care and primary care reform, and the move to new governance models such as health hubs and the introduction of integrated funding models the use of data and quality improvement plans to drive integration and the increasing emphasis on engaging patients in care design. I'm pleased to say that our session will start out with a patient. That is something HQO has recommended that we all think uh, of these sessions as how does the patient experience this, the, uh, the system and we'll be hearing from Ed in a little bit. So the objectives of today's session are to gain an understanding of how Ontario currently performs uh, related to the delivery of integrated care, to learn more about the transformation occurring in the system from experts in the field. Uh, before we begin, I, I like to cover presenter disclosures. No speakers have any relationships with commercial interests. They have received no commercial support and have no mitigating potential bias. The session did not receive any commercial support. So I'd like to introduce our speakers. The first speaker is Edward Rublinski. Uh, Edward, uh, and I spent a half hour speaking to Edward before the session. He spent 10 years in teaching and administration in school boards in Montreal. He then moved into executive roles in the automotive industry for 15 years, followed by 10 years in senior executive roles in gas utilities across Canada. He completed his career providing human resources and labor relations advice to multinational corporations. He is now retired. He is married to Mary Ferguson Perret and has five children and 14 grandchildren. He lives in Lakeville, Ontario on a 100-acre farm. Our next presenter is uh, Wenny Doyle. Winnie has over 35 years of experience in health care as a midwife, registered nurse, educator, and senior executive. She's currently the vice president and chief nursing executive at St. Joe's Healthcare Hamilton, which is part of the St. Joe's Health System. Winnie has a very strong commitment to driving improvement, quality, and patient engagement in both the local and system level. And she holds a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing and a Master's of Nursing Administration, and she is, is on the faculty of the School of Nursing, McMaster University. Our third presenter is Wade Petronik. Uh, Wade is a certified member of the Canadian College of Health Services Service Leaders and a professional accountant. He is the president and CEO of the Dryden Regional Health Centre since uh, 2005 and a healthcare executive for the past 24 years. In his recent role as chair of the OHA Small Rural and Northern Hospital Leadership Council, Wade re recently co-chaired the Provincial Multi-Sector Health Hub Advisory Committee. He's also the chair of the Northwest Health Alliance, a shared service corporation for the 13 hospitals in Northwestern Ontario, and a member of the Northwest Lynn Integration Leadership Council. Our fourth presenter is Dr. Dr. Parl pa Dr. Pauline Pariser. Uh, Dr. Pariser has pr practiced med family medicine for over 30 years and is the founder of the Tattle Creek Family Health Team, an associate professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. She is an award-winning teacher 
and in, 19, or in 2009 was named Family Physician of the Year for the Toronto Region. In 2011, the Tattle Creek Family Health Team was recognized by the Ontario College of Family Physicians as Family Practice of the Year. In 2012, she was appointed Associate Medical Director at the University Health Network and Primary Care Lead for SCOPE, uh, which is Seamless Care Optimizing the Patient Experience. She has led the Midwest Toronto Health Link since 200, 2013. To start off, I'm just going to give a, a brief presentation to set the, uh, the scene for the talk that we'll be having. And it's about improving the patient experience through integrated care. Those are two themes I'm very passionate about. In my first days at the Lynn, I've talked a lot about uh, uh, increasing the patient voice in our work. And when I left the ministry, I was doing a lot on integrated care. So I think bringing these two concepts together is, uh, is an ideal way to approach it. I'm not going to spend too much on the context for change. I think Danielle uh, Martin did an excellent job in telling us, and we know that the the various surveys show that we, while we deliver good health care, we can do better. And in international comparisons, we often don't fare that well. Uh, the study that uh, the Commonwealth Fund uh, released in 2014 noted that there is an opportunity to improve communications and coordination of care. And I hope we'll be hearing a lot about that from our uh, speakers. Uh, we recently uh, introduced integrated care pilots uh, in this province uh, based on the St. Joe's uh, model, and I'm sure we'll be hearing about that from Winnie, and they show high patient satisfaction, improved clinical outcomes, fewer emergency department visits, and shorter hospital stays. So what is integrated care? Uh, well, Ontario's health system typically delivers high-quality episodes of care. Work is being done to improve the delivery of integrated care. I think it's interesting when we even look at the, the phrase integrated care, as if that is the way patients would describe it. But when we talk about integrated care, we're meaning the improved coordination for the patient between the transitions of care so the patient knows what is happening and when it is happening. In this model, a single funding amount is used to pay for all the care related to a condition for a set period of time across transitions of care. Uh, successful imp implementation of this patient-centered approach will lead to improved patient experience, quality, and sustainability. Moving from my provincial role, uh, working for the Ontario Public Service for uh, 33 years. I think uh, there is a role for government and uh, partners and I just wanted to reflect a little bit on the government role. Government facilitates change. It's a facilitator for health care transformation but it needs its partners to deliver. So the government would typically uh, ensure that sound frameworks for governance, legislation and funding are in place to enable the change. Uh, it would empower providers and consumers uh, by giving them the tools they need to achieve the most appropriate health care services guided by best practices. It would keep a keen eye on the bottom line, something I did for a long time, uh, ensuring value for the investments and then performance measurement, consistent uh, measurement value for money and sharing best practices. So with empowered patients and residents, an empowered system, We'll see the transformations we want on the four key dimensions in the Minister Hoskins' uh, Patients First Agenda, and today we're looking at the integrated care theme. The provincial priorities are around the patient. Uh, we have the Patients First Action Plan for Health Care. Uh, we spoke a little bit uh, this morning about Excellent Care for All in 2010, sent the, uh, the, the foundation for uh, organized focus and accountability to deliver high quality patient care. Uh, Health Links, an initiative to link coordination around complex patients. Uh, health system funding for reform, looking at that as a lever to uh, coordinate and integrated care. And more recently, our integrated funding model initiative. 
So the Lynn role in integrated care, and I'm just learning that. Uh, but in my first month, uh, we have spent a fair amount of time on the integrated funding models. There's six uh, demonstration projects, and Donna Cripps is leading the Lynn uh, CEOs on those initiatives. They span five Lynns. There's 34 health service providers with many projects uh, that actually span the Lynn boundaries. And these projects are all aimed at improving communication and coordination of care at the transition points. Uh, health links spanning 14 lens with health service providers working together toward coordinate care, driving improvements in health and social services needs for vulnerable patients, and expanding partnerships with other sectors including social services, education, and housing. And then literally dozens of local partnerships and initiatives uh, the LINs are working with their health service providers and patients on the ground to deliver the care. And finally, critical success factors, uh, patient engagement, ongoing meaningful patient engagement where the patient voice is reflected and involved in co-design of their care. And without the voice of the patient, who are we designing the system for? So with that final comment, I'm going to hand it over to Ed, who is going to tell us from his perspective with uh, his journey in the health system. So yeah. It's okay, I can make it. I won't fall off, I promise. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, good morning. Um, I'm a little nervous because I haven't done this for about 10 years now since I'm retired to speak to so many people. Anyways, let me take you on my journey. I wouldn't be here basically if it hadn't been for an integrated system that my family physician practiced. So the first experience with that, as I moved back from Vancouver to Toronto, I met my family physician for the first time. We had a chat, da 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 da. And about six months later, she said, you know, well, maybe we ought to do a, a general and do that. She said, okay, one of the things you're going to have to do is do blood work and you're going to do urine and all that sort of good stuff. So that was, went to the lab, did that. Two days later, got a phone call saying, hey, come on in. Good to talk to you. So, Talk to each other and say, ah, there's blood in your urine. Hmm, all right. Okay, you're going to go and do ultrasound. So go and do ultrasound. Ultrasound, two days later, reports back in. There are spots on your bladder. Ah, okay, fine. A couple of days later, cystoscopy over at the, uh, Mount Sinai. What I'm trying to point out is that it was one thing after another because my physician basically, first of all, was proactive. Secondly, advocates for me and follows up. So then I have the operation and go through the chemotherapy, and, which is BCG and all that good stuff. And I'm fine. So I'm here today. But it had it not been for a simple routine examination, I probably would have not been here as my friend who had the same issue, never made it. So that's fine. Two years later, I go see my family physician, and she says, you're at that age where you need to go and get a colonoscopy. Ah, not interested in that, but you do it. So over to St. Mike's. And you go through the process. You wake up. Physician says, guess what? You have cancer. Oh, OK. So you have colorectal cancer, and you now, now what? What goes on? You've got to go find yourself a surgeon. Because he only does that, colonoscopies. He's not, he probably does surgery, but he wasn't going to be my surgeon. Anyway, so over to UHN. The process starts there. I had a trip planned to Europe. My physician said, you aren't going anywhere. You're going to go first things first, chemo. So you run around. With 24 hours a day, seven, six weeks of chemo constant uh, with the tube up your arm into your wherever it goes into your heart, I guess, or close to it. And so you do that. Then radiation. So my question was, if you do the chemo and you're killing everything, you're doing the radiation and killing everything, why are you doing surgery? Because we have to make sure. Fine. So you do that. So you go through the process. 
And now what happens is you go through the process. After seven, eight days, you're going to be released. So you get released. And everything is fine. But six weeks later, you have a fever. You can't move. You're sicker than a dog. Back in. Now what you have is that there's an abscess where the surgery was done, where they put the colon together. So now they say, ah, we're going to do intervention radiation, which means they take a tube, go from the back to the front. Sorry. <laughs> so they do that. Not fine. That lasts for about six weeks. The CCAC are coordinating. They get involved with me. They do the draining and all that good stuff. Fine, go back in, tube is removed. Six weeks later, I go to the cottage, I'm doing, having a great time, develop a fever again, go back in. Sure enough, do another MRI. I mean, there are dozens of MRIs that were done on me. I should glow in the dark. <laughs> no. Anyway, so it's done. The abscess is back. The surgeon says, we're going to go again. And I said, okay, but this time you're going to do something a little different in the sense you're going to do freeze it, whatever. You're not going to do it raw. Okay, said, okay, fine. It's done. Six weeks more of the tube and the draining and all that good stuff. And the physician says to me, he said, if this happens again, I'm going back in. I'm going to separate it and you will be. You know, I said, no, no, you won't see me. So he never saw me again after that. Six. Uh, but what had happened to me was because of all the delays I only did two rounds of chemo after the surgery and the uh, radiation. And then they took me off because they were basically killing me. And they said, if we give you the last shot, you may not survive. So they said, you're not having any more chemo. But I'm here today. So I'm doing fine. And so that was 12, about 11 years ago. And the second time I went in, of course, SARS was raging. And the individual, the porter, who happened to move me from the emergency room over to my room, the next day I found out he had SARS. And to this day, he's not working. Anyways, but that was an issue that I was worried about. But I survived it all. Then I went to Shanghai and China and Beijing. In Beijing, I got sick. So we talk about communications. Communications are critical to me anyway between myself and my family physician. So I'm in Beijing. I sent an email over to my family physician and said, look, I have a fever. So she sends back an email and says, book your flights as soon as you can, get out. Uh, my wife had some antibiotics with her. She said, take those until you get here. When you get here, I'll see you right away. So she sees me right away into the lab because blood work. My blood count is at basically dangerous levels where she said, You're gonna, there's something wrong, so I'm going to retest you again. So she retested me again, and my, my blood count even dropped again in those three or four days. Now she said, look, I can't get you to a hematologist for at least three to six weeks. The only way you're going to get a hematologist is go to emergency. So I went to emergency and sitting around for whatever period of time. The hematologist saw me along, and then my surgeon found out that I was in. He came to see me. Between the two of them, they booked me in again. And guess what? The abscess had returned seven years later. And so I was lucky because there was a, my blood count was finished. There was nothing they could do with it. But there was a new drug that came out on the market that was quite not... I guess, approved. And it was Nuprogen. So the Nuprogen basically kicked up my blood levels. That lasted for about six weeks, and I, then my hematologist took me off. Well, I want to talk about how communications is critical to me. Coming from a business world, it's imperative. And you use the technologies you have. And so email existed seven years ago. So between my hematologist, I saw him once, and he did what he had to do. And and I said, look, I'm, living, I'm sitting in this corral of yours for three hours. I'm wasting your time. You're wasting my time. We've got to do something different. So he said, OK. I said, why can't we communicate with email? Because if I'm well, and I tell you I'm well, then what do you want to see me for? To read me the numbers? 
you can send them to me. So he'd send me my blood count, and that's fine. Then I'd just email it over to my family physician. So he, she had, this went on for three years, and finally he said to me, he said, look, I don't have to monitor you anymore. See your family physician, and if something goes wrong, do it that way. It's fine. Did it. Okay. But what I'm trying to get at is the movement from point to point was always advocated by my physician, followed up by my physician, and proactively moved me through the system. So to me, the one critical thing about family physicians, they have to advocate for you. They have to be, move you through the system and know the system inside out and who's who in the zoo. Now, the other, now, time goes on. A year ago, about a year ago this year, I couldn't walk. I got every joint in my body just swelled and ached, and basically I was in sheer agony. So here we go again. So I see my family physician. She looks at me. She says, okay, we're going to go see an internist. Fine. He starts a process. That doesn't work. Go see a rheumatologist. Eh, that doesn't seem to be working. Second, my family physician says, you've got to have a second opinion. Over to the Western. We see the top fellow in the Western. He's looking. In the meantime, there's two things that are going on. There's a spot on my lungs. Because I'm from Montreal and from the Ottawa Valley, most people, a lot of people from that area have this spot on their lungs. And because they wanted to make sure with prednisone, this spot wasn't going to loosen up, you need a tur tuberculosis test. Guess what? No one has the test because it ran out <laughs> okay. in the province. So I had to wait two weeks. Finally, we got the test done. I went to my family physician, her nurse practitioner, did it. But what I'm getting at is my family physician was the one that got it. We tried hospitals. We tried other clinics. We did all kinds of things. But we couldn't get it. Anyways, long story short, I didn't have TB. Okay? And it wasn't locked in that spot on my lungs. That happens to do with some fungus from Montreal or from the Ottawa, St. Lawrence Valley. OK, so you now go and you have arthritis. And you, your family physician is looking at you and says, that we're not getting anywhere. So then they said, OK, we're going to send you over to women's. And there's a, an acute ambulatory unit there. Man, what a place. You go in there at 9 o'clock in the morning, and every test that they need to do is done. MRIs, CAT scans, x-rays, blood work, blood cultures, because I had a fever. And no, nobody ever, because of the fever issue, nobody wanted associated with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So finally, they did it. And then, and then I had to come back on the following Friday, the, the, that same week. And they realized that fever had nothing to do with that. And so they started me on another drug called methotrexate. So I take methotrexate and prednisone. I'm trying to get off the prednisone. And, I guess the methotrexate is a lifetime drug. And you learn how to self-inject, because I learned how to self-inject when I was taking the Nuprogen seven years before. To me, there's, two, there's three things that the healthcare system needs to move into, as from a patient's point of view, not from yours, mine. One is, let's talk to each other, but it doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. It can be done by emails, by whatever systems we have. I remember when... The first time around when I had the bladder cancer, I had to carry my file from one hospital to the next because they didn't talk to each other. There were no systems, and it was all paper. So fine, I don't mind. But you try and get hold of somebody to give you a photocopy of your file. It's like it's precious metal. I mean, it's mine, it's not yours, it's mine. I own that damn thing, it's all about me. So to me, that's important that the patient have access to their information. And you need to have communication with your family physician. The family physician, to me, is critical. The communication is critical. We have the technology. Why don't we use it instead of wasting each other's time doing things face to face? Now, I'm lucky. I'm damn lucky. I have a physician that I can pick up the phone today and say, look, I need to see you. So can you get here this afternoon? If not, then can you get here tomorrow morning? 
So that's her practice. So I can get there almost when she has the time. I don't wait three weeks. I wait maybe four hours, maybe 24 at max. So to me, there's a whole new way of practicing, and this is great because to me it helps me. So when I was uh, two weeks ago, I developed a fever, and because uh, my system has uh, is, uh, immune problems, in other words, if you develop a fever, I phoned, and I got a phone, an answer, and she said, can you get here? I said, I can't get here. I live in Lakefield. I can't get there in time. Go to emergency. I went to emergency. They went through the system. And I said, okay, now that you have them, they went through everything again. You know, the only thing they didn't do was an MRI. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, so anyways, they didn't do that, but everything else they did, the blood work, cultures, all that. And it came back negative. My fever went down. I was released. And then that information will end up getting to my family physician. Okay. And so this is my story. My story is I'm lucky. I had a physician, family physician, who practiced integration long before the concept began. And so I'm lucky to be alive because had it not been for a routine, simple thing of blood work and urine analysis, and had it not been a simple thing like go and get a colonoscopy, those two things would have probably done me in. And the rheumatoid arthritis, I have to tell you this little story. Because the young lady, doctor, okay, so she was, uh, this was three weeks ago when I found out I was going to speak here. She knew that I was speaking here because my family physician had met her and talked to her about it. And so when I said this to her, I said, I'm going to be speaking to her. And she said, well, you have something good to say about me. <laughs> so I said, yes, thank you very much because you've done a great job in getting me moving on. So that's my story. I'm, the, the issue to me in the long day, after all these medical episodes, and I call them episodes because they're intervals in my life, today I feel as good, as healthy, as energetic as I did 12 months ago before I got hammered with the rheumatoid arthritis. And I mean hammered. I couldn't walk. So to me, that's the whole idea. The idea is to get you to where you were before. And I'm lucky. Because in the last 14 years, I've had major episodes, and I'm well. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ed. By the way, I've avoided yes. telling you who my family physician is. She's <laughs> sitting up here. It's Dr. <laughs> Pauline Pariser. I noticed he wasn't mentioning uh, who the physician was, but uh, we've got a good panel here with uh, different perspectives on how, they, how uh, different people in the system are uh, uh, providing Ed with excellent patient care. So Winnie uh, is, uh, Doyle is next. Thank you very much and good morning. Now, just let me see if I, oh, no, there we are. I did the wrong thing. Um, so I just wanted to start out with a couple of comments uh, um, about the work we've done in St. Joe's Health System um, and, and giving you a little bit of a um, background on what were some of the big things that helped us move forward. And uh, one of the things that was absolutely essential was the voice of government and the encouragement and vision of government. And I am very struck at the moment, particularly in light of our federal election, the degree of cynicism that we have about government, which I think is an incredibly dangerous thing. And we really want to, uh, I think, rethink where we're at in Canada. But our project um, on integrated care was enabled because of the vision of government and the desire for government and our Lynn to see something better and something that improved the system. And I really want to pay tribute to uh, Susan, who was, uh, um, worked very closely with our CEO, Kevin Smith, in getting this project off the ground, because without you, I don't think we would have uh, been where we are today. So let me tell you about uh, um, uh, what we did and uh, hopefully give you a flavor as to uh, the progress we've made. There are a number of things that I think are worth highlighting um, beyond uh, um, Susan's help and uh, the vision of government um, that were formalized and I think our work aligned. And the comment was made this morning um, and it was getting at, uh, Danielle made it about 
taking advantage of the opportunity. And I think this work was uh, aligned, and Susan mentioned these things this morning, with the action plan of the government, uh, with ECFA, um, the spirit of health links, uh, and I think many of the elements in health links uh, speak to integration. Um, health system funding reform, the uh, patients first, integrated funding models, and then locally our own strategic plan. Before we got this off the ground, we recognised the need that we needed to be doing things that were much more um, radical than what, we, than what we were doing if we were going to see the change in our system for the patients that uh, we serve. I'm doing... Oh, there we are. I'm, I'm a slow learner. Um, so what was, what was the problem we were trying to fix? And this has already been alluded to in comments that uh, have been made this morning in the uh, um, opening remarks and the presentation that Daniel gave us. I think many elements of our system, the, the care is superb, and I've been, you heard this morning, uh, um, I'm one of those people who's long in the tooth, um, and I have throughout my career seen people that were absolutely admirable in the effort they went to in working to make things better for patients. But I think what's lacking is that being reliable patient over patient. And this fragmentation that we see in the system is something that I think we're all trying to really put our shoulders to the wheel and improve. Uh, the coordination um, was lacking at the systems level. And continuity of care, and continuity is one of the things that I think um, when I'm a patient myself, um, for those of us providing care, when we're serving patients, it's the peace when broken, um, I think, um, can desecrate the trust um, and really be quite profound in patients believing that uh, we're going to be able to improve things for them. Lots of frustration in the system. And I think when we look at the value in the system, um, which I think we're all uh, really trying to uh, make sure we're using our resources more wisely than we have historically, trying to uh, take out some of the rework and waste. And particularly when we think of uh, um, unneeded ED visits or the way care can be provided to avoid that and reducing readmissions. So um, the diagram I have here, I just, uh, I'm trying to demonstrate to you um, what in fact was the state before we introduced our integrated care uh, program. Um, and uh, the processes um, for the hospital, our community partners um, um, were quite siloed. I think many people trying to do their best. There wasn't a lack of um, effort, but the structure didn't enable integration in the way that we needed. So what we changed with our pilot was uh, developing an integrated model um, with an integrated clinical team across the hospital and the community providers, an integrated care process, and we, uh, like many of you will have done on processes, we mapped out the existing process. It was extraordinary learning for all of us, and uh, I think a bit shameful in the sense that the number of uh, pieces that weren't connected was really quite extraordinary. And then as we rebuilt the process, as we were doing it, we were always working with um, consumers and patients to uh, uh, ensure their voice was uh, in the design of uh, the processes we were fixing. And we, had an we developed an integrated medical record. So there's three components, integrated team, integrated process, and integrated medical record. And from the value, when we're thinking about triple aim, I think uh, um, I'll speak a little bit at the end about uh, um, an integrated bundle in terms of uh, funding, which we're now moving towards. So within the integrated care model we developed at St. Joe's Health System, there were seven key elements. Integrated care coordinators, and I think Ed's just very eloquently spoken to the role of primary care in playing that role, and I couldn't agree more um, that that is um, absolutely foundational to our success. So uh, um, integrated uh, care providers, partnership with a single provider in the community. And we had the opportunity to do this because St. Joe's Health System is uh, two acute care hospitals, uh, a, a home care agency, long-term care, um, who weren't involved in this project. Um, but that, that partnership between the hospital and the community was a, uh, a central one. 
an element of the project was a 24-hour access line for the patients we were serving. And interestingly, most patients tried the line. Um, and quite a number of them tried it just to see if it worked. But when the patient had a question, um, had a, a, a patient or a family member, um, there was access 24 hours a day. And the, the purpose of that was to ensure the care was timely and that we did our best to avoid ED visits. Of course, there are times when an ED is absolutely the right place to go, but we were working to avoid ED visits to the greatest capacity that we could. The next element was a highly engaged and committed team. And this is something I think we all know is central to success in almost all of the work that we do. And it's something that uh, um, I think is easy to create in a pilot, it, well, let me, let me uh, just uh, revise that, easier to create in a pilot, much tougher when we're trying to get something working at a provincial level. And that commitment and energy and mindset, I think, is, is, is never underestimate the power that that can bring to any work that you're doing. And certainly for us, it was central. We shared an electronic health record, and we, did, we invested very little to have that happen. We, our mindset was, what can we do with uh, um, what we already have that we can ensure um, this works and we don't introduce to, uh, new costs? We use Skype and the phone a lot. And we had concern and still have concern coming forward our way that uh, we shouldn't be using Skype. We talked to the patients about what they wanted to use. And in fact, it was a patient who suggested we start using it. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's important that our privacy legislation, I think, is there for the greater good. But we do need to be thinking about the goals. And the, we, we need to make sure we get those barriers out of the way. Um, and timely access to medical care, specialist and primary care. Um, so that, uh, that gives you an overview of the elements of the integrated care. Um, and uh, this just, I think, emphasises the clinical groups that uh, um, we chose. The we started at St. Joe's in Hamilton. And the three clinical groups we chose, we chose because of readiness and because uh, um, there was alignment with the work that was being done provincially on quality-based procedures. We wanted to make sure um, we were building capacity. Um, and then with our spread to St Mary's, we um, included uh, cardiac surgery. So uh, just to uh, um, summarise, uh, where are we at now? Um, so this work has uh, been part, it's, 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 it's not to, Part of what has informed six, the six provincial projects that are moving forward, and we in our Lynn are spreading this this model across all the acute care sites. Um, the complexity with that is quite different than the pilot. So we have, I think, a lot of learning underway at the moment. Um, but the importance is we improved the patient experience substantially. We improved health outcomes, particularly with length of stay, readmission rates, and reduced uh, ED visits. Um, and we uh, it increased value in the system. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Winnie. That was great. Our next speaker is uh, Wade Petronick, and he'll tell us how the North has been doing this for years. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's, it's great to be in Toronto. I don't come down to Toronto that often, so we're stuck in the middle of Blue Jay fever, which is really exciting too. But uh, in the North, we're excited about health hubs, and um, health hubs is a concept that's been around for some time, and we've talked about it. And what really health hubs are is integrated care organizations that uh, work together to improve uh, coordinated coordination of care for all of our patients. Dryden is a small community. We serve a population of about uh, 15,000, um, halfway between Winnipeg and Thunder Bay. We're about 2,000 kilometers from Toronto. So because some people don't really understand how big Ontario is. It's a huge province. We have a huge land mass, about the size of France, and about 250,000 people scattered in the northwest region over that area. So it's quite a challenge in delivering care to the, those isolated communities. We have, we're part of the Northwest Lynn and the Lynn has a blueprint, a health services blueprint, which talks about uh, service delivery 
at three levels, a local health hub level, so there's 14 community local health hubs. There's district programs that offer higher levels of care. And then there's regional programs that share expertise across the entire region. And I think it's a very good model in terms of, um, you know, Dr. Martin talked this morning about we have to quit doing pilots and start looking at the system and actually changing the, the whole system. So I think the blueprint kind of sets the stage for that. And the Northwest Lynn and all the partners there have been working very hard at advancing that blueprint. I think it's been in existence for just over three years now. And progress is always slow, but at the same time, I think uh, the end state will be very good for patients and for our communities. We do have uh, it at Dryden Regional Health Center, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Dryden Regional Health Center. We have uh, current governance for a family health team, a hospital service, and a mental health and addictions program. So those are the, key, the three key uh, programs that we operate and govern. But all across the north, uh, there, are, there are small hospitals that uh, they do provide a wide range of, and continuum of services, which makes a lot of sense because there's not a lot of critical mass in these communities. There's not a lot of expertise, or the expertise that we have is highly valuable and highly scarce, and we need to be able to share that across the system. And I think some of the examples that we've used and the flexibility that we have through this kind of a governance model has enabled us to be responsive to patient needs. And I'll give you a, a personal example. I went to, uh, had the occasion to go to the emergency department a couple of weeks ago for a health concern. And in the north, going to the emergency department for primary care is okay. We do it all the time. And the reason why it's okay is because the, the family physicians that work in the community also provide hospital-based service. So they, they aren't just delivering primary care. They're looking after inpatients, they're in surgery, they're they're doing obstetrics, they're doing oncology for our satellite chemotherapy unit, they're doing uh, assisting in the operating room, all kinds of other things. So they're not always available to their primary care patients. Anyway, I happened to go for a health concern and about three days later I received a, a letter in, in the mail from our family health team and it said, Wade, you were in, and this was like three days, it was like a Sunday and by Wednesday I had this letter I said, Wade, when you're in the emergency department, we noticed your blood pressure was rather high, and we'd like you to come in and talk to a nurse and have that evaluated. So whose blood pressure isn't high when they're in the emergency room? <laughs> but uh, so I did have it evaluated. They took uh, my blood pressure over a period of time, and, and uh, I didn't have a, a serious issue there. But I thought that's pretty cool because I didn't even know about it. Um, so the coordination between acute care and primary care and mental health has been a, a terrific uh, uh, opportunity for us to better coordinate care. We do outreach programs, so we, so we take teams of primary care, uh, allied health professionals, et cetera, out to seniors' apartments to do clinics. We take them out to First Nations communities to do clinics. And it's amazing how many vulnerable people are out there that really need care that aren't getting any care because of it may be a transportation issue or it may be uh, some of these people that are shut in. And, it, and kind of identifying those people that need help at an earlier stage keeps them out from getting to an acute phase of disease and certainly helps them uh, avoid more serious uh, repercussions of that later on. We also are able to uh, address mental health and addictions issues that present to the emergency room so we have a uh, a mobilized team that responds to those clients who present to the eMERGE and they are hooked up with resources and uh, the necessary supports and counseling um, following their ED visit. People from the family health team visit patients in the hospital with chronic disease and other things to talk about okay this is what's going to happen after you're discharged. These are the programs and resources that are available to you to help you manage your disease and we have all kinds of resources and expertise to do that. So I think that's really important, that, that connection to make that transition very seamless. We do follow up home visits. So when a person is discharged with COPD or CHF, they receive a, a home visit by 
one of our family health team nurses to make sure everything's okay, to answer any questions the patient might have, to do an environmental scan with the patient to see how they're coping within their home environment and to see if there's any other supports, to see, make sure they're taking their medications properly, et cetera. So I think that's been very good. We are very high users of telemedicine and technology, so we're, we're kind of linked between long-term care and the emergency department to avoid transferring elderly patients to the eMERGE. Uh, we use uh, telemedicine to access specialty services on a regular basis as well. So what are some of the advantages? Well, we have an integrated governance structure and a skills-based board. And in small communities, you know, governance and volunteers are scarce. They're a scarce resource, just like healthcare professionals. And people with skills who really understand the health system are very scarce. And it takes a lot of time, orientation, and training to get good governors in our, in our healthcare system. So we've been able to uh, provide that infrastructure for a lot of these other services that they otherwise wouldn't uh, be able to have. We still make sure that we reflect the diversity of our community and make sure that um, people are in touch and engaged with uh, folks using the, the, the health system in our community. Everything is, is focused on the patient and we start every meeting with a patient story. I think uh, another really important part is the culture. We spent a whole bunch of time in our organization trying to get in touch with our values as an organization and how we can connect on a regular basis to the patient experience. And that's been just wonderful in terms of um, celebrating the, su the successes that go on every day. I want to congratulate all of you folks that work tirelessly and you don't get enough thanks and praise in my opinion for all the hard work you do to improve the system and really there's a lot of heroes out there a lot of heroic stories that go on every single day that we never hear about of course all we hear about is things that go wrong and and other stuff but certainly there's a tremendous amount of good work going going on there single governance obviously we reduce the bureaucracy and efficiency we have integrated quality improvement plans across the organization, which is, uh, is very good as well. And we share the, the scarce back office resources and other things that might not be available to some of the smaller community agencies. So these are some of the other health hub advantages. I'll cut it off there, thanks. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Pauline Pariser, and she'll be giving us the urban uh, family physician uh, perspective. Thank you. I'm going to stand here so I can actually see the screen. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm here to highlight my experience with HealthLinks to date, which has seen a mobilization of patient-centered skills and resources that previously operated in separate um, uh, healthcare silos, but through dynamic partnerships have uh, developed working coalitions that transcend those divisions so that um, groups that didn't work together before, so unlike the North, typically we have lots of great resources in the city, but they don't talk to one another, have come uh, to uh, working across sectors. So for example, uh, right up near the top, you'll see the TCAT uh, arrow. We know that uh, patients with substance use disorder um, come to the emergency room frequently and repeatedly. And so what's happened is the hospital has developed a relationship with a community support agency that didn't exist before. And so that when the patient with substance use uh, shows up, there's an immediate notification of the case manager of the Toronto Community Addiction Team who comes to the emergency room, sees that patient in real time, and begins a connected, coordinated process. What we've seen is ba better patient experience, better outcomes, and a 35% decrease in repeat ED visits. But here uh, today, I'm going to speak about uh, the project that started it all for us in 2012 it predated HealthLinks, and it uh, stands for Seamless Care Optimizing the Patient Experience or SCOPE. And that began when uh, the Toronto Western Hospital reviewed their emergency room visits and hospitalizations and discovered there were 50 practices in the hospital corridor that were sending patients in huge numbers to the hospital. 
and did a very um, progressive uh, maneuver. They asked the doctors, what is it that you need to improve the care of your complex patients? So they did a grassroots uh, consultation. And on the basis of what those doctors told us, and on the basis of reviewing the literature, we developed a virtual interdisciplinary team around those practices. So what those doctors told us first and foremost is we want a single point of access. We don't want 12 referral forms. We don't even want a lot of emails. We want a streamlined process. So they got that. They got one number to call. And if they press one, they get an internist on call who actually answers their questions, gets back to them within 30 minutes, triages the case in some uh, instances, many instances actually, sees patients who are decompensating, people who ordinarily would have gone to the emergency room. So someone with heart failure, asthma, someone with a possible blood clot gets seen in a short stay unit that day, the one that Ed spoke about, um, and also connects them to subspecialty services. If they press two, they get a dedicated CCAC coordinator that mobilizes uh, community and home supports for their ho fragile homebound uh, population, that starts a coordinated care planning process, and that also connects them to other case management services in the community. If they press three, they get a dedicated nurse navigator. And this person has become the eyes and the ears of these practices. She works very closely with their frontline staff to be able to find the right resource within the acute care sector, to expedite uh, referrals that need to be done, and again, to connect them to more comprehensive services if, if needed, including um, the services of a dedicated RN health coach that works with patients on chronic disease self-management. And lastly, if they press four, they get a radiologist on call. And that uh, process started because the family doctors told us in those original engagement sessions, we send a lot of patients to the emergency because we need urgent imaging. So the radiology people at uh, U of T said, okay, how can we do it differently? So they get uh, a call center, they get uh, urgent imaging expedited so they don't have to go to the eMERGE, and the family physicians are educated as to what's the right test, what's the appropriate use of radiology. And then lastly, it's not on the slide, they get access to patient results online so they can get uh, patient records and results in an um, uh, accessible manner. So what we've learned is uh, that this seems to really work with these practices. We started with 30 practices and now we're working with 120 family physicians in the greater Toronto area. And uh, the, they have been consistently happy with the process. So over 95% satisfaction ratings that the service is relevant to their practice. Um, we've learned that uh, about six, more than 60%, 64% of these encounters have diverted patients from the hospital. So they seem uh, to, you know, to have impact in that way. We've done qualitative interviews with the uh, family physicians who've told us that patients feel better and cared about and uh, they can access more comprehensive care in a timely manner. And they've also talked to us about the fact that they feel less isolated. So that's a phenomenon in the last number of decades that family physicians have become more cut off from hospitals. They don't do rounds in the morning. Uh, they don't, uh, in, in the urban centers, work in the emergency rooms. They have more trouble accessing specialist consultation. So they feel that there's more of a connection with the hospital and that they can uh, develop these collaborative relationships. I think that, to me, has been the biggest change since I started practice, I hate to say, in 1982. Um, that uh, we've moved, or we are moving, it's not there yet, we are moving from a culture of competition to a culture of collaboration. And maybe, you know, necessity being the mother of invention, that's, we've been driven to do that, but who cares why it happened, it seems to be occurring. And in fact, one of the unanticipated benefits of SCOPE has been that uh, we've developed this platform or this conduit for specialists to start to engage with family physicians. So we have many other specialty services, such as psychiatry, rheumatology, gynecology, who are asking, can we meet with your docs? Can we find out better ways to deliver services uh, for their populations? And so we have people on the same side of the table working for best care for all. Thank you. We've got, uh, we've got plenty of time for questions, so uh, if you've got a question, can you come to the mic in the, uh, the center alleyway? And I hope someone's going to break the ice and ask the first question, because we've had some great panelists, 
and I don't want to be the one that has to kick it off. So thank you very much. Go ahead. Tom, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Sandra Elziel, a family caregiver for my husband and Crohn's disease, later years, comorbidities. Morbidities, he passed away two years ago. But Winnie, <laughs> you got me with your access line 24 7. When you have a chronic complex disease, Kevin knew when things were going south, and care doesn't fit into nine to five or nine mm -hmm. to seven yeah. or that sort of thing. And often what we had to do was take the taxi to the ER. Yeah. But what I guess I want to ask you first of all, you got buy in for it. How did you sort of get it set up, and is it still going today? Yeah, we, the, for the populations that are in the integrated care program and the spread in the LIN, it's a key element that we will uh, um, maintain. So uh, um, we, we run it seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It doesn't get huge use, but it's a key element in helping somebody um, get an answer to something quickly so that uh, um, their, their care is more timely and hopefully they're... Uh, um, when they're in a difficult situation, um, that's problem solved effectively. So we definitely see it as a key element. But it's not just the line. It is the care providers knowing the group of patients that they're serving. Um, I think that is a very important element of helping to make it successful. Yeah, no, I just actually re really want to reinforce that point with Kevin, who is complex, his own, you know, getting access to providers that know him and he knows them. Because yes. going to the ER, you start from square one, yeah. no matter who you are. And also, just to reinforce your point, and I'll let this person ask a question, there's such a tremendous sense of relief for patients and families when they are able to get access to the system. It's just, so to your point exactly, making that call, even if, you know, it's just, it just, it, I can't un overemphasize how valuable that is for the patient and families. Thank, Thank you. you. I would just add to the St. Joe's, uh, the, the St. Joe's uh, pilot was that the patients had confidence that when they called the number, they weren't just going to get, say, a receptionist that didn't know their case. They knew when they called, the person was going to deal with their problem or going to get the help uh, from the from the backup nurse or physician. So that's just really important on these lines that they are effective and meet the patient needs and not just be a number you call and, and don't get what you need. Thanks. Go ahead, Jen. So my name is Vidhi Takar. I'm a doctoral student at IHPME. That was a great plenary session. Uh, my question is directed to um, Susan as well as the family physician and even Kevin, you can feel free to answer um, as well. Um, so you had mentioned SCOPE, which is a very interesting initiative for primary care. And we all heard in the plenary session from Dr. Danielle Martin, these great initiatives that are happening in, in Ontario. Now, how do you see that initiative being scaled up to communities in nor rural communities in Northern Ontario? Is there the possibility to spread this innovation? Um, and what are some policy levers from government, and perhaps, Susan, you can speak to that, that government could put in place um, to scale this innovation? Do you want to start? Okay, I'll start. Um, so I, I think that, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, perhaps this is a grass is always greener uh, response, but to me it seems even simpler to scale it to communities that are, I think, by their very nature, better integrated. And it, it's really, um, um, a bringing the people who are uh, key to that system working, so senior management at hospitals, champions, I think champions have been very key among the family physician group, among the hospital group, and patients to really look at what works in your center. And then devising a streamlined approach to make that happen. Uh, I, I think that uh, so far the hospitals and the CCAC have been funding the staffing model. Um, I think I would, you know, uh, defer to Susan as to whether if, if we're able to show impact, i.e. 64% diversion from hospital, perhaps this will be something can be sustained at a, at a provincial level. But I, I think it's just looking at how you can make it work in your community. It's not a difficult um, project to uh, emulate. Um, the, I am familiar with the scope, uh, the scope project, and I did have an excellent visit over at uh, Women's College. There was a bit of money to get it started, and I was struck by Danielle's comment about the difference between spread and scale. And uh, I think the government could probably facilitate 
some scaling and we've been doing that I think on the health links initiatives now in the integrated funding models because we're finding people don't often need a lot of money they might need a little bit of seed money to get started maybe a bit of motivation maybe something that brings uh, people together I think the scope is an excellent uh, an excellent initiative and you know maybe with the HQO we could start talking about which of our successful projects across the system should we systematically be trying to spread more broadly and scope of course works very well in a I would say a, a, a urban area where we have a lot of uh, solo practitioners uh, and it may not be something that we would put into a Dryden so we'd have to see where do we need a, a project like that but I think that's a great uh, great question hi there do we need to turn yeah. can you hear me yeah great um, we can't so see first, you, but we can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, first of all, for I think the great panel discussion, and it was it's always good to have that patient experience, uh, you know, to hear what the patient is feeling as they're navigating through the system. So thank you for that. Uh, my question, I think, is more directed to Winnie Doyle. Winnie, it's Amy Khan. We've dealt in oh. previous capacity before. Uh, great hospital, great initiative related to the bundled care. Um, you know, the more I was reading up on it, and I wanted to ask you a specific question. From my understanding, I think the funding model focuses on funding a care coordination, care coordination position at the hospital to help with that specific case that you know, you're assigned a care coordinator upon admission and that person will help you navigate through discharge. My question to you was, and maybe it's something that I don't understand that maybe you can help me understand better, where we feel the issue is related to transitions is when it comes to community transitions. So you made that discharge, you made that handoff to mm -hmm. the community, that follow-up care, uh, so you've, you've processed that to get that patient into the community first. How do we work on building that care coordination arm a little stronger when it comes to those community transitions further? Uh, because I know most of our healthcare services are very front loaded and they're very focused on, you know, eight to 12 weeks of home care to just, just to get the patient up and running and, you know, doing well in home. But we know that if they're not connected further within the community, they will come back into the ER. So that community connection always gets lost when it comes to care coordination. And I wanted to just ask you if that was a particular focus of this model or, or not. Yes, it is. Just to clarify, we were funded by the ministry in the pilot for the care coordinators. Now with the spread to all of the acute care sites in the Lynn, those dollars are coming from the participating organizations in the bundle. So from the CCAC and from the hospitals, there's not incremental funding now. The role of the uh, care coordinator, and I uh, apologize, I obviously didn't explain it very clearly, is that the, that co care coordinator is engaged with the patient. Um, in our work we were doing, it was uh, um, for the total joint replacement for the duration of the patient's hos before hospital, after, during hospital, and transition to the community until the patient was discharged back to primary care. The uh, spread in the Lynn, we're following patients for 60 days, and that same care coordinator will be involved with the patient across those transitions for COPD and CHF. Okay, thank you. I think we've got another, qu another question, go yes, ahead. Yes, hi there. Uh, Daphna Carr with Health Quality oh, hi, Ontario. Daphne. Thank you very much for a great uh, session. A simple question for you, I hope. Um, what, in your opinion, can you give us an example of where you've been able to improve patient experience um, in the least costly and, mo and least complex way that's resulted in integrated care? I'll, I'll Everybody's looking you. at me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that you have a chance. <laughs> so again, I'll comment from the rural and northern and remote perspective. And I think one of the fallacies out there is uh, on where people receive their care and how expensive it might be. It's different in the north because we have a lot of fixed cost capacity there. And there's actually parts of the system that aren't very well utilized, but we have to have that capacity in order to serve the people that do present for those various illnesses. So it's really important in local communities that we have flexibility to be able to utilize the capacity that we do have and create that critical mass. Because if we're gonna have a hospital service, we don't wanna be taking all the critical mass out of the hospital, then the hospital will fail. And obviously that's not a good uh, situation for the community. So I think uh, cost is, is uh, one element for sure. And you have to look at uh, things like, so if you have an empty bed, for example, and there's lots of empty beds in the north in small communities, and there's lots of alternate level of care patients in those beds, and there's empty beds, but 
Is it cheaper for that patient to spend one or two extra days in length of stay to make sure that they're, uh, they've got everything set up at home or to duplicate that kind of a service in, on, a, on a home care basis where you know, some of the home care professionals have to travel pretty far distances in between the patients that they serve. So they might only visit like three or four patients a day because they're traveling so far between patients. So the mix of services needs to be different in different parts of the province is what I'm saying. So again, you know, there's, there's common rhetoric out there that's, that's blanketly accepted across the province. Got to reduce ER visits. ER visits are, are a natural thing in the north because of what I talked about in my presentation. But not only that, we don't have walk-in clinics, so it's the only place for access. So I think it's different in every part of the province. I would just add, my former boss always talked about the modern invention of the telephone, but calling people is highly effective. And Ed, when he chatted uh, with Ryan and I before we came to the session, talked about his physician phoning him while he was in the emergency room to see how it was going and getting feedback at the time of the emergency visit. So it is the kind of the personal touch with the patient. Hello. Great, great speakers today. My name's Kathy Peters, and I'm with Behavioral Supports Ontario from h and Lynn, so congratulations, Winnie, on representing uh, your good work in our region. I wanted to just uh, pose my question to, to Wade, and I think Edward did a great job of talking about integration looking like communication and collaboration across the sectors. And so, Wade, I, I saw your highlighted circle, your visual diagram with long-term care in there, and I think that's a huge piece that, that we often don't talk about. In our BSO models, we have a combination of long-term care and community service models. And so what I often hear is that, that transition and, and making it seamless between long-term care and emergency departments and, and back and forth, and to avoid that as much as possible. So are you able to expand at all on your use of telemedicine between long-term care and ER, and in particular for that older adult population who may be experiencing some responsive behaviors and, and how in the moment people can, if, if, you're, if you're leveraging that at all for that, I'd be interested to hear how. Sure, I think, uh, is my mic on now? Mm -hmm. Sure, I think that's, that's a great point. I think having the capability and capacity was the first thing. So the long-term care home didn't have telemedicine capability. So we got together as a community and said, okay, let's get you hooked up first. So let's get you hooked up to OTN. And uh, actually, since that time, it's not only been used for ED consults in terms of, of uh, patients checking, or, uh, checking in with the ED to see if the patient needs to be transferred or not, but it's also been used by those patients and families to access specialty services outside of the region in Thunder Bay or whatever they might be. Uh, so they have access to specialists from the home now and they have access to educational resources and they also have access to uh, actually family visits. So we've had great success in connecting um, elderly patients with their family members who live in communities far, far away, which has been tremendous for those patients. Thank you. Um, I think we're, I got the uh, notification that our session now has uh, reached its end time. So I want to thank uh, the panelists. I want to especially thank Ed for sharing his, uh, his uh, experiences with us today. And uh, our other panelists, and I want to thank the audience for uh, joining us and asking us questions. And I hope you enjoy the uh, rest of your day at uh, the HQO uh, Quality Transformation Conference. Thank you.